So our first lecture is a fairly basic lecture. We're going to talk mostly about terms that we're going to use the rest of the semester. So you are taking, believe it or not, anatomy and physiology. Hopefully that's what you signed up for. Anatomy and physiology are two different things that we're usually going to talk about together. So anatomy is structure. It is what things look like and where they are. Whereas physiology is function. How things work and why they work that way. And so we'll talk about the two together. We'll see what it looks like, we'll figure out where it is, and then we'll learn how it works. As we go through the semester, we're going to talk about the body in a number of different levels. And so we're going to start really, really small, the chemical level, and then we're going to work our way up. The first few lectures, we'll have a lecture on chemistry, we'll have a lecture on cells, we'll have a lecture on tissues. And then moving forward from that, more or less, we'll have one lecture per organ system, like the digestive system, or the circulatory system, or the endocrine system. And that will carry us until the end of the semester. So we'll figure out how these things are made up at the microscopic level, and then we'll talk about how our body actually works. And so the body is made up of seven, or sorry, six different levels of organization. We're going to start at the chemical level, so atoms. We have a periodic table in the back. We're not going to use it all that much, probably to your happiness. But we do have to have a lecture on chemistry because we are made up of atoms and molecules. That is what we are. And so in order to understand the body, we have to understand how this works. Because everything that happens in our body happens because of the rules of physics and chemistry. They are what determine what happens in our body. So at the chemical level, we take atoms of the different elements on the periodic table. We combine them together to get molecules. Molecules are multiple atoms put together. An example of a very, very large molecule is DNA. DNA is millions and millions and millions of atoms put together in a single molecule. We take that molecule, we combine it with other molecules and arrange them in a functional order, we get a living cell. Something that is able to, to move, something that is able to communicate with things around it, a functional unit of life. That is the cellular level. If we take a bunch of cells that are similar to each other and then combine them together, we get tissue. So a tissue is a collection of similar cells that are going to work together for one purpose. If we then take those tissues we take multiple different tissues, we can put those together to get an organ. So an organ, by definition, has more than one type of tissue, and those are going to be different tissues working together for a higher level purpose. So here we have the stomach. Within the stomach, we have different types of tissues that we'll learn about. There's epithelial tissue, there's connective tissue, there's smooth muscle tissue, there's more epithelial tissue. Inside the stomach, each one, each one of these types of tissue has a function. Epithelial tissue makes the outside of the stomach. Connective tissue holds things together. Smooth muscle is going to contract your stomach to help you digest your food. So each one has its own specific purpose, but as a whole, they have the shared purpose of creating a stomach which holds food after we eat it and will help to digest it. If we take a number of organs and put them together, we get an organ system. So a stomach 
is part of the digestive system. In the digestive system, we have a bunch of organs, each with slightly different functions, but together serve an even higher order of function. So in the digestive system, we have our stomach, which is also the liver, the gallbladder, the intestines, your mouth, your salivary glands. All of those have a shared purpose of helping you to digest food and absorb nutrients. But each organ in that system serves a slightly different purpose. You know that clearly your mouth has a different purpose than your intestines. And your liver is different than your salivary glands. But in the big picture, they all help you to get the nutrients from your food. And then you can take the different organ systems, put those together, and you get an organism. We are organisms. Our body as a whole is an organism. So turning around and going back the other way. I am an organism. I am number six here. I, though, am made up of different organ systems. Every part of my body is going to be included in at least one organ system. So one of those organ systems is the digestive system. The digestive system is made up of different organs in different parts of my body. One of those organs is the stomach. The stomach is made up of different types of tissue because there's different parts of a stomach. And so the parts of the stomach are different tissues. The tissue is a collection of similar cells. And each of those cells is made up of molecules which are made up of atoms. So I don't think this is too complicated of an idea. We're going to start, like I said, at the beginning of the semester, starting on Thursday. We'll start here, work our way up to here, and then have a whole bunch of organ system lectures. So like we said, the chemical level is made up of atoms and molecules, and the atoms are the elements. So those are the most basic building blocks in the, in the universe. Okay. It is the smallest unit of matter, and matter is objects. These atoms are going to be part of chemical reactions. Everything that happens in our body is a chemical reaction. Just me moving my arm over here requires a whole bunch of chemical reactions. Just me standing here, existing, surviving, my brain going through thought processes, is going through a whole bunch of chemical reactions. And these atoms react with each other to form molecules. The molecules were at least two different atoms together. They could be two of the same element. You could have two oxygens together forming an oxygen molecule. Or you could have an oxygen and the sulfur. You could have a combination of like water, H2O, which is two hydrogens and an oxygen. If you have at least two atoms together, that is a molecule. Those molecules come together to make cells, which are the most basic level of life. So the atoms are the most basic unit of matter. The cells are the most basic unit of life. If you take a cell and break it into pieces, those pieces will not be alive. The cell is the smallest thing that can be alive. We have a number of different types of cells that we'll learn about when we go over the tissue. But we have muscle cells. We have nerve cells. We have blood cells. We have skin cells, epithelial cells. We have adipose or fat cells. We have a bunch of different types of cells. Put those together and you get tissue, which was a group of cells 
that are all the same type of cell that are going to work together for a single purpose. We have four types of tissues that we'll learn about in our tissue lecture. There's epithelial tissue, which the best example of that is your skin. Your skin is epithelial tissue. There's connective tissue. An example of that is bone or fat or cartilage, things like that. There's muscular tissue. There's certainly the skeletal muscle that you probably think of when you think of muscles, but there's also a couple other types of muscle. There is smooth muscle, which we saw in the stomach. It's kind of, it kind of takes a circle and, and squeezes it together, rather than a skeletal muscle, which is used for moving. And then there's cardiac muscle, which exists only in the heart. And then there's nervous tissue, which is your brain, the nerves, all of your senses, things like that. And we'll talk a lot more about these when we get there. Put those tissues together, you get the organ. Talked about that. Some organs, things that would be considered an organ, stomach, heart, liver, lungs, brain. These are what you would immediately think of when you think of as organs. But there are other things that you would not think of as an organ that by the definition presented here are in fact organs. Something like a bone is an organ because that bone, we'll learn, has more than one type of tissue. Something like a tooth. A tooth by itself is an organ. Your skin is an organ. So anything that has at least two types of tissue is going to be Organ. So take the, then the, take the different organs together. We have our organ system. The example that we learned was the digestive system. We're going to cover each individual organ system as we go. Each organ system will have its own collection. And finally, there is the organism. That is the complete animal, complete plant, complete fungus, whatever it is. Okay? So in this class, we are going to focus on humans and nothing other than humans. So for us, the organism is the human. Think of it in terms of a book. Each organ system is slightly different than the next. Those are the chapters, but if you put them together, you get an entire book where if you take a chapter out of a book, the book may not make sense. But there are some chapters that if you take out, they're not very good, the book itself can kind of get by. Same thing with us. We have, organ, we have organ systems that are more important than others. If we get rid of our cardiovascular system, we are no more. But if something like our endocrine system is not working right, we may not be in good shape, but we can maybe get by. Next thing we have to talk about is something called homeostasis. Our body likes to be in its happy place. It knows where it wants to be and it wants to stay there. When we interact with the world outside of our body, that body, that world interacts with our body and it takes us out of our happy place. Staying in the happy place is a process called homeostasis. It tries to keep our body within certain limits. Like a good example that we'll talk about is body temperature. You know that if your body temperature gets too high, you'll get sick. If it goes even higher, you will die. If you get too cold, you'll get sick. If you get really cold, you'll die. And so your body is going to try to maintain homeostasis. It has a narrow window that it needs to keep your body temperature In our body, we have the cells that make up the tissues and organs and everything. Outside of those cells, though, is basically water. That is called interstitial fluid. Interstitial fluid is the water in our body 
outside of cells. What is in that interstitial fluid is going to have a big impact on the function of those cells. If you eat something toxic, that toxin is going to get into your interstitial fluid and it's then going to get into your cells. If the toxin gets into your cells, those cells can die. And so part of maintaining homeostasis is maintaining what is in that interstitial fluid. What is found and dissolved in the water in your body? Every system, every organ system in our body has some role in maintaining homeostasis. But there are two main ones that play the biggest role. That's the nervous system and the endocrine system. The nervous system is your brain. It's not just your brain, but the biggest part of your nervous system is your brain. The brain is the control center of your body. If something is going to control the levels, the function of your body, trying to maintain everything in a tight window, of course it's going to be the brain, which is the nervous system. It can tell organs to shut on, it can tell organs to shut off. It can tell you to shiver, it can tell you to sweat, it can tell you to do a whole lot of things. The endocrine system is similar to the nervous system in the fact that they are both communication systems. The nervous system communicates with electrical impulses, and the endocrine system uses molecules called hormones. Hormones are just molecules. That's all they are, but they're little chemical messengers. So an organ in your body can make a hormone that it puts into the bloodstream, but once it's in the bloodstream, it goes throughout your body and can tell different parts of your body to react. So if you eat something bad, something in your digestive system can put a hormone into your bloodstream that can cause you to feel sick. If you get frightened, different hormones will go into your body that will make you scared. It will kick in what's called the fight or flight response. So the nervous system and the endocrine system are going to coordinate with each other to control all of the other organ systems. They'll tell them what to do and when to do it in order to maintain this homeostasis. To maintain homeostasis, we use something called feedback systems or feedback loops. They are systems designed that when we get knocked out of normal, creates and start the process that's going to reverse that and turn us back into normal. These feedback loops have three parts. There's a receptor, a control center, and an effector. So we'll see what each of those does. So before we talk about the body, a perfect example of this feedback loop is the heating furnace system or the air conditioner in your house. So we're going to set our thermostat to let's say 20 degrees Celsius, which is about 70 Fahrenheit. So what happens when the temperature in your house falls below the setting on your thermostat? It's cold. It tries to go back up. It tries to go back up. What is the first thing that happens to try to make it go back up? It, you, have, you, have you ever been standing next to your thermostat when the furnace kicks on? What determines when the furnace should, should turn on? And the temperature is set on the what? The thermostat. So the thermostat is measuring the temperature inside of your house constantly. So that is our receptor. The receptor is what monitors where we are currently. It doesn't have the power to do anything. It just monitors where we are. So in our house, the temperature is going to fall. Let's say it falls 19 degrees Celsius. So the thermostat comes on. Inside that thermostat, there's two things. There's a thermometer, and then there is a little computer chip. 
So the thermometer is measuring the temperature, and when it tells us it goes below 20, it sends that signal to the computer chip. The computer chip is our control center. The thermometer was the receptor. The computer chip is our control center. It says, it's cold in here. I need to make it warmer. I'm going to make it warmer by turning on the furnace. So the thermostat sends a signal to the furnace. The furnace turns on. It is our effector. The effector has an effect. So the, thir the furnace is what actually heats the place up, but the furnace is dumb. It doesn't know when to turn on. It had to be told to turn on by the thermostat. So the furnace turns on, the temperature comes back up to 20, then there's the thermometer in our thermostat, measures the temperature again, and says it is now 20 degrees. I don't need to be any warmer. This is what I'm supposed to be at. And so the control center then sends a signal to the furnace again to turn off. So the control center is what changes? Correct. The control center is what receives a signal from the receptor, determines does something need to be done or not, and if it does, sends a signal to the effector. So the computer chip in your thermostat is constantly receiving that signal from the thermometer. Most of the time, though, it's at a good temperature, so it doesn't need to change anything. But once the temperature drops, it sends a signal from the control center to the effector, the furnace, which turns on, heats the house, until we're back up to the set point. Then the control center sends another signal telling the furnace to shut off. But when the furnace shuts off and it's cold outside, the temperature drops again. So the whole system goes over and over and over and over again, which is why it's a loop. It never stops. It's a feedback loop because the outside, outside of the house, is affecting the inside of the house. So then the inside of the house says, well, you're, I'm not going to let you make me cold, so I'm going to turn on the furnace to stay warm. So the effector, does it just receive signals from the Yes. That's all it does. All it does. And okay. all the receptor does is send the signals to the control center. The control center receives signals from the receptor and sends signals to the effect. So we do almost the same exact thing with our body. We maintain temperature in our body. But like in our house where we have a furnace and an air conditioner, our body has processes used to heat us up and processes used to cool us down. The normal body temperature is 37 degrees Celsius or 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. That is where we want to be. <coughs> if we get very far from that at all, our body is going to start a feedback loop to try to get us back to normal. So let's say that it is summer out, and so we go outside. If we go outside in the summer, what happens to our body temperature? It goes up. When it goes up, we can't let it continue to go up, and we can't let it stay high for a long time. We have to get it back down. What do we do to cool off? Biggest one is sweat, right? We sweat. We also do something called vasodilation. Vasodilation refers to dilation or expansion of blood vessels in our skin. Why do you think we'd want to expand the blood vessels in our skin when we're too warm? The sweat, we'll learn, sweat does come from our blood, so that the water in our sweat was originally water from our blood, so we need to get that water to our skin so they can come out and sweat. <coughs> Why else do you think? So you're not trapping the heat. So you're not what? Trapping the heat. Trapping the heat where? Inside yes. So it is warm in here. I feel warm. I feel like I am probably red right in the face. Am I? Right now? Are you serious? Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's just warm up here. I don't know. Is it cold back there? Huh. Well, I feel very warm, so I feel like I'm probably flush right now. I am not sweating, though. The blood goes to the skin because the blood was originally in the center of my body. If the blood goes to the outside, it can then release the heat. So like you're saying, if the blood does not go to the skin, it's trapped in the center, and that the heat is then trapped in the center of my body. The vasodilation and sweat work together to help us get the heat out of our body. So the vasodilation helps us get the heat to our skin, and then the sweat helps us get it from the skin off of us. So let's say that works really well. And so we come back down. But now we're sweaty. What happens if you're sweaty and you go to the cold air conditioning? Yeah. You get too cold. And so your process, your sweating and your basal dilation work, but then your body, when we evolved, we didn't have air conditioning. So now we have two things going on. We have the sweating and the basal dilation plus the air conditioning. So now we're going to get too cold. So now our temperature is below 37 degrees and we start shivering. And we also undergo vasoconstriction. The blood vessels are going to get smaller. So in this case, we want to trap that blood in the center of our body. Because that is, number one, where we're not going to lose the heat. But also think about it in terms of survival. If we are outside and we are hypothermic, what parts of our body do we have to save? The main vital organs. If you're outside, where do you get frostbite first? Your fingers, your toes, your nose, your little appendages. I can live without fingers. I can't live without a liver. So I need to keep my liver from getting frostbite. So I'm going to trap that there. But if you start shivering and you vasoconstrict, most likely you're not freezing to death. You're at home. You have a jacket somewhere or a sweater or something. And so once you start shivering, you go put the sweater on. But now you did two things. You shivered and put the sweater on. So now you're going to get sweaty again. <laughs> and so you just go back and forth and back and forth. And so we're trying to limit how far we get from normal and how, the amount of time that we spend away from normal. We want to stay at 37 degrees. OK. Changing gears a little bit, now we get into some of our terms that we're going to use to describe our body. First thing we have to learn is what's called the anatomical position. When we talk about the body, we talk about where things are, directions from one thing to another, we are always going to use the anatomical position. So that is going to be a person standing facing you with head looking straight forward and legs are kind of shoulder width apart facing feet facing you hands are at the side palms open like this this is anatomical position when you refer to a direction you always refer to it in that position okay even so if you have a patient that is in a position other than that anatomical position, you have to think, if they were in the anatomical position, what would those directions be? Okay. For example, we'll learn this, but on arm, we use the terms proximal and distal. Proximal meaning closest to the shoulder, and distal meaning most distant from the shoulder. The anatomical position just Versus up and down, where is my hand? Is it proximal or distal? It's distal, and this is down, right? What if I go like this? Now distal is up. And so if you have a patient laying there with their arm up, you're going to still say the distal end of their arm. So you need to imagine what, where that would be in the anatomical position. 
So this is anatomical position. There are a whole bunch of body regions listed here. You do not need to know all of them. You will need to know the ones that are listed in your lab manual. We'll go over these at 8 o'clock. And so we're not going to spend your time on it now, but these, lab, these anatomical regions are going to be considered lecture material as well. So they can be on lecture quizzes, they can be on lecture exams. This is? This, but you're only responsible for the ones that are in the lab manual. There are maybe half as many in the lab manual. Where's the lab manual? So it's on canvas that you, so you can print, or it's for sale in the bookstore. That's the thing, there's like seven pages, seven dollars or something. Yes. Yeah. So these are small regions, but we'll, we'll talk about those. But then there are large regions that they fall into. So there's the head the neck, the trunk, which is the chest and the abdomen, upper limbs and lower limbs. So those are pretty easy, right? Very clearly head, neck, trunk, arms, legs. <coughs> when we talk about one region compared to another, we use these directional terms. And proximal and distal is one of them. These directional terms are only used to talk about one region relative to another. You can't say that the head is superior. Okay? We're going to learn that superior is up, but in reality it's towards the top. So you can't say the head is towards the top. Towards the top of what? It's towards the top compared to my heart, but you have to have two things to compare to use these directional terms. And for the most part, they're going to come in pairs. There's up, down, left, right, front, back, things like that. Superior, we'll learn, is towards the upper part of the body, and inferior is towards the body. And so that's a pair that go together, and they're opposite of each other. So let's go through these. You do need to know all of these terms, and we will use them as we go through the semester. So we just learned that superior is towards the head. And inferior is away from the head, or down. But the up and down is only if I'm standing. Because if I'm laying down, my head is just to the side. It's not up compared to my heart. It's just to the side but we consider it superior. Superior is towards the head, inferior is away from the head. So that we say the heart is superior to the liver. Heart is here, liver, liver is down here. So the heart is closer to the head, and so it is superior to the liver. The stomach is inferior to the lungs. The lungs are up here, stomach is down here. The stomach is further from the head, and so it is inferior. You may see some other terms here. Cephalic and cranial mean the same thing as superior. Cranial is head. We'll learn that cephalic is also head. Inferior is caudal. Do you know where the caudal fin on a fish is? The caudal fin is actually the tail. So it is as far from the head as possible, right? And so the caudal is the same as inferior, it's away from the head. The next pair, pair is anterior and posterior. Anterior is towards the front of our body, posterior is towards the back. Anterior is the same as ventral. Posterior is the same as dorsal. Where is the dorsal fin on a fish? Or, or, a, or a whale or a dolphin? It's on the back. So think about if I had a fin, a dorsal fin, where would it be? It'd be on my back. So dorsal is my back. 
ventral, I don't have a good way to remember. <laughs> you just gotta remember that. The anterior ventral is to the front, posterior and dorsal are to the back. And so you would say the sternum, which is the breastbone here, is anterior to the heart. The sternum is in front of the heart, and so it is anterior. The heart is posterior to the sternum. The esophagus is posterior to the trachea. So we'll, we'll learn that when we take something in our mouth and it goes down, it can either go through the esophagus into our stomach, or it can go through the trachea into our lungs. It's kind of, it's a one tube that splits into two. Then they go down our body like this, one in front of the other. So the esophagus is posterior to the trachea. So which of the two is the front one? Not the, not the esophagus, yeah. The esophagus is posterior, so it's in the back. So the trachea is the one that is in front. Next pair is medial and lateral. Medial means towards the middle. Think of the median, the middle line. If something is closer to the middle, we say it is medial. If it is further from the middle, we say it is lateral. So the lungs are lateral to the heart. The heart is on the middle line. The lungs are off to the side a little bit. And so the lungs are lateral to the heart. The transverse, the lungs, or I'm sorry, I'll skip this one. The ulna is medial to the radius. So the ulna, and the radius are bones in your arm. So in the anatomical position, in the anatomical position, it says the ulna is medial to the radius. So those are the two bones in my forearm. Which one is the one on the outside? The ulna is medial, and so it is the one on the outside. The radius is the medial side. I said that backwards. Yeah. The ulna is medial, which is towards the center. So the ulna is on the inside. The radius is lateral then, which is the outside one. Intermediate just means in between two things. The next is ipsilateral and contralateral. So ipsilateral means on the same side and contralateral means on the opposite side. And when we talk about sides here, we only mean left and right. You can't use ipsilateral and contralateral for front and back, top and bottom, anything like that. It is left and right only. So ipsilateral means two things on the left side of the body or two things on the right side of the body. Contralateral means one on the left, one on the right. No exceptions. And so, this pinky and this wrist are ipsilateral. This thumb and this thumb are contralateral. This thumb and this elbow are contralateral. Does that make sense? Next is the proximal and distal. Proximal and distal are only used for appendages. Your arms and your legs. Only. So proximal means closest to the connecting point. So the connecting point is your shoulder and your hips. And so my elbow is proximal to my wrist. My wrist is distal to my elbow. My elbow, though, is distal to my shoulder. We cannot use superior and inferior for arms and legs. Because we can do this. We also cannot use superior and inferior. So we can't use superior and inferior for arms and legs. We can't use proximal and distal for our trunk, our head, or our neck either. For trunk, head, and neck, we use superior and inferior. For arms and legs, we use proximal and distal. Finally, there's superficial and deep. Superficial is shallow. 
is towards the outside of our body, deep is towards the inside of our body. And so our heart is deep compared to our skin. Our skin is superficial compared to our lungs. We'll, I think we'll cover these again in the lab in a little bit. So here are some examples. What would you say the humerus is compared to the heart? Well, I, I would say lateral. Yeah. What about the esophagus compared to the stomach? Superior. superior. Esophagus is superior to the stomach. What about the esophagus compared to the gallbladder, this little green dot there? Superior. superior. There's multiple options on this one. Uh, so the esophagus is on the midline, the gallbladder is off the midline. So the esophagus is medial. The gallbladder is lateral. What about the phalanges, which are the fingers compared to the radius? Distal. Distal. They're more distant from the connecting point. Similar to our directions, we are able to talk about planes. And so a plane is essentially a cut. So we can cut something, whether it's an organism or an organ or whatever we're looking at, along different planes. And we have four planes. So as an example of a plane, we have the sagittal plane. A sagittal plane is going to cut something into right and left sides. So if I'm going to cut me on a sagittal plane, I'm going to cut this way. That way I get left and right sides. Now you can imagine though, if I'm going to cut in the left and right sides, I can cut right down the middle and get halves, or I can cut off center and get unequal parts. Those are both sagittal planes, but the one right down the middle is called a mid-sagittal plane. The parasagittal plane is off to the side, either a little bit or a lot. If I cut over here, that'd be a parasagittal plane. Or if I cut just a little bit off center, that's also a parasagittal plane. The only way it's not a parasagittal plane is if it is right on the midline, exactly on it, then it's a mid-sagittal plane. A frontal plane is easy to remember because it divides you into front and back, or anterior and posterior. So for me, that would be cutting this way, front and back. A transverse plane cuts me into top and bottom, or superior and inferior. So just straight across like this, into top and bottom. This can also be called a cross section. The final one is an oblique plane. An oblique plane is on a diagonal. So if you're not one of the others, you're oblique. So here's examples of this. And so this line is a mid-sagittal line because it's sagittal. It cut it in the left and right, but it's right on the midline, and so it's mid-sagittal. This one is parasagittal, because it cut in the left or right, but it's off center. The transverse plane cut in the top and bottom. The oblique plane was at an angle. It could be there, it could be there, or there, or there, or any different angle. And then finally, there's the frontal plane, which is hard to see in a two-dimensional picture, but it's cutting her in the front and back. We can also use these same planes on organs. So if we take a brain and cut it along the mid-sagittal plane, we get left and right halves or left and right hemispheres. And so when you look at the, at the section, that's what you see. 
take the same brain, cut it with a frontal, on a frontal plane, you get a frontal section. So that's what you see. A transverse plane cuts in the top and bottom, and that's what you see. This is why we have these different planes, because you're, if you're someone like a pathologist, and you're looking at these things, you need to know how it was cut. Because if somebody tells you you're looking at a mid-sagittal section, and you see that, either someone labeled it wrong, or someone had a very messed up brain, <laughs> okay? So you need to know what you're looking at so that you know what it's supposed to look like. Next we have body cavities. In our body, we have open spaces where the organs are going to exist. So they're going to contain the organs, they're going to protect the organs, they're going to usually be kind of hard and bony on the outside to protect them from injury. They're going to hold different organs in different places in our body, and they're going to support them. They're going to hold them in place. So we have three main cavities. <coughs> we have the, ver the cranial and vertebral cavity, so they're connected. The cranial cavity is where your brain is. It's inside of your skull. And that is then connected to the vertebral cavity, or vertebral canal, which is where your spinal cord is. And we'll learn when we get there that the spinal cord is just a big, long, skinny part of the brain. They're connected. There's no hard division between them. So this is all one big cavity that has two subparts, the cranial cavity and the vertebral canal. Below that, we have the thoracic cavity. Thoracic cavity is your diaphragm up. The diaphragm, we'll learn, is the muscle at the bottom of your lungs that makes them expand and contract. And so that is this line here. So the lungs are up here, the heart's up there. The lungs and the heart are in the thoracic cavity, and they each have their own little subspace. The lungs are in what's called the pleural cavity. We'll learn that pleura and plural refers to lungs. The heart is in the pericardial cavity. You can see that like cardiac, right? The heart is in the pericardial cavity. And then there's a weird little spot in there called the mediastinum. So imagine we've got our lungs here. The heart would sit here. There's another lung over here. There's this little open area right there where there's nothing. That's the mediastinum. It doesn't, there's nothing there, it's just a cavity. It doesn't really have a function, but they can't just leave an empty spot in the body without giving the name. And so I don't know why they picked a weird name rather than calling it open spot or something, <laughs> but they called it the mediastinum. Then down below the diaphragm is the abdominal pelvic cavity, and this is one of the best named things in the entire semester because the abdominal pelvic cavity contains the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. <laughs> the abdominal pelvic cavity contains the abdominal cavity, which is your abdomen, and the pelvic cavity, which is down in your pelvis. There is no hard line between these, but you can imagine this is the pelvis, and so in the pelvis here is the pelvic cavity, and then up here is going to be the abdominal cavity. When we look at the abdominal pelvic cavity, we can break it into what's called quadrants. The quadrants break it into four sections. There's left upper, right upper, right lower, and left lower. What's the first thing you notice when you look at left and right there? They seem opposite. It is the patient's left and the patient's right. And so when you look at a patient from the front, the left upper quadrant is on your right. 
And also remember, if they're upside down, if you have a patient that's doing a hand headstand or something, <laughs> the upper quadrant is going to be closer to the ground. It is their upper, towards their head. So, we'll come back to this in lab. What, you, what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to know which organs, which, at least which major organs, are in each quadrant. Tonight? We'll, we'll cover it again tonight, but it'll be fair game for the quiz on Thursday. And so if I say, give me an organ in the right upper quadrant, you could say liver. Or if I said, what quadrant contains the gallbladder? In this case, you would say right lower. You don't know where the gallbladder is there. I know that. Okay. Mm -hmm. What you'll learn is that actual bodies don't look nearly as nice as diagrams. Okay. So on exams and things, you will have diagrams where there will be a very clear gallbladder. They might even say gallbladder. Okay. And then you'll be able to figure out which quadrant it's in. Let's take our break. We'll come back five after eight on that clock. We'll do the last slide and then we'll go into the lab. We have to get through a whole bunch of chemistry in one lecture, and so we're going to stay very superficial. We have to start from the very, very beginning of elements and atoms, and then get all the way up to the types of molecules that make up our body. Okay? If you have questions along the way, don't even hesitate to ask me. Okay? So chemistry starts with matter. Matter is stuff. Matter is anything that takes up space and has <coughs> mass. And so if it takes up space and it has a weight to it, it is matter. That matter is made up of atoms. Atoms are the smallest building block of matter in the universe. There are subatomic particles. Sub particles that there are subatomic particles that come together to and make atoms, but at that point they're just very basic. And so hydrogen and oxygen and carbon and all those things are made up of the same subatomic particles. But they're clearly different. And so an atom is the smallest unit that retains the chemical properties of that element. So if I have a chunk of carbon, I can make that chunk smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and it's still carbon until I get down to one carbon atom. If I break that carbon atom apart into subatomic particles, it's not carbon anymore. Now it's just a piece of junk. <laughs> so this is looking at copper wire. So what you're looking at is just a, imagine a coil of copper wire. This wire here, you zoom the way in. This is well beyond the microscope. This is called the atomic level. This is not something we can really see. But what you would, would see, if you could, is a whole bunch of copper atoms lined up, neatly arranged together. That's a copper atom, a copper atom, a whole bunch of copper atoms. And these atoms come in a different shapes, different sizes, different flavors, and that's on the periodic table. The periodic table lists the different types of atoms, the different building blocks that we have to work with. Everything is made out of those building blocks. We can take those atoms and we can stick them together. If an atom is the most basic form, the most smallest piece, but molecules allow us to take the different combinations and put them together to make unlimited numbers of different molecules. We can take two of the same element and stick them together, and that is a molecule. So here's two red atoms. The fact that they're the same size and the same color in the drawing tells us that they're the same element. So we've stuck two of them, stuck two of them together. That is a molecule. There are two atoms stuck together. That is a molecule. Down here, 
we have three atoms stuck together. The fact that these two red ones are identical to each other tells me they're the same element, but that black one is a different element. Here we have three atoms, two of them are the same, one is different, but it is still a molecule. This is a molecule, this is a molecule. If you have at least two atoms stuck together, regardless of what type of element they are, that is considered a molecule. This says the molecule is two or more atoms bound together in a discrete arrangement. What that term discrete arrangement is, is an exact arrangement. So this is carbon dioxide. You don't need to know that, but it is. The carbon dioxide has red, black, red. If I rearrange that, I could have two reds and a black, but maybe it would be red, red, black. See how I can move it around with having the same ingredients in that molecule? But in that case, it is not CO2 anymore. It is not the same molecule. So that molecule is that combination in that order with those same connections. Like we're talking about, the atom has subatomic particles. There are even more basic building blocks than that atom. Some of them are outside of what we call the nucleus. Some of them are in what we call the nucleus. The nucleus of the atom is in the center of the atom, and that's where most of the stuff is. <coughs> Flying around that nucleus, we have electrons. Electrons have a negative charge. Think, elect think about electricity. These have a negative charge charge and they fly around outside of the nucleus. In the nucleus, in the center of the atom, we have protons which are positively charged and neutrons which are uncharged or have no charge or they're neutral. It's all the same thing. Uncharged, neutral, no charge, those are the neutrons. Neutrons, neutral. Make sure you know that electrons are negatively charged, protons are positively charged, neutrons are neutral, and which ones are in the nucleus, which ones are outside of the nucleus. For us in this class, and even most of the classes taught, chemistry classes taught at Santa Fe, neutrons have no function. You don't start doing things with neutrons until you get into like nuclear physics and things like that. If you're in a ra radiography program, maybe you would talk about this, but we are not going there. Protons and neutrons are in the nucleus, electrons are outside. If we take those atoms and we want to take, put them together to make a molecule, we have to have some sort of glue to hold them together. The glue that's going to hold those atoms together is called a bond, or a chemical bond. If you take atoms together, put them in a molecule, if there are multiple elements <coughs> involved, that's now a compound. If it's all aluminum, or all vanadium, or anything like that, it's an element. But once we get something like CO2, carbon dioxide, where there's carbon and oxygen, that is now called a compound. This here is calcium carbonate. You are not going to have to write formulas and no names and things like that. And this is calcium carbonate. Ca is calcium on the periodic table. CO3 is carbon and oxygen, but together as a unit we call it carbonate. This is a compound because they're bound together and there's more than one element involved. Here's our carbon dioxide, or CO2 again. We have carbon and oxygen. They're bound together, more than one element, and so it is a compound. There are two types of these bonds. And the type of bond that we have is going to be dependent on which type of elements are included in that compound. We have something called an ionic bond, which is found in ionic compounds, and compounds does have an O. Extra O in there. 
These are also called salts. You know the word salt. Do you know what you think of as salt? Table salt. Say the table salt. Do you know what the, f the chemical name for that is? Na. Na. Sodium. Sodium. Sodium chloride. It's NaCl. Okay. So sodium chloride, what we call salt, in terms of the actual definition of a salt, is just an example of a salt. It is not actually salt. Okay. A salt is anything that has a, an element from the left-hand side of the periodic table. We call those metals. We're not going to go that far in this, this class, though. So if you see something on the, from the left-hand side of the periodic table, that is going to make that compound a salt and is going to have ionic bonds in it. If you have two elements or more from the right-hand side of the periodic table, that's going to be a molecular compound made up of covalent bonds. And that can only be from the right side? Yes. So it's the ionic producing the left hand. Yeah, so an ionic will have at least one metal, which is from the, the left hand side. This, if you look back at the periodic table, it's that side over there. You're never going to have one that has more than one from the left. So you're going to be one from the left and then one or more from the right. So an ionic bond works by the transfer of an electron. So this is that's an important idea to understand the difference between ionic bond and a covalent bond. In an ionic bond, you're going to have one atom that is going to give one of these electrons, that's the negative particle flying around the nucleus, it's going to actually give it to a different atom. So we say that electrons are transferred. And the one that's going to give the, ele the electron is the metal, the thing from the left-hand side of the periodic table. We can give charges not only to subatomic particles, but to atoms themselves. And the charge on that atom is good based off of the balance of those electrons and protons. The electrons are negative, the protons are positive. If you have an equal number of both, they cancel each other out and the atom has no charge. But once they're out of balance, we now have a charge. So let's imagine we have an atom, and let's say that there are three protons in the nucleus, and then there are three electrons flying around to the outside. What is the total charge on that atom? Nothing. Zero. Total charge is zero. Three positive, three negative, they all cancel out. But let's say that we give away one of those electrons. It's, positive. it's now positive. Positive how many? One. 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 There's three positives, two negatives, and so there's an extra positive. Does everybody see that? So now the charge is one positive. Technically, in chemistry, we write the positive or negative after the one, but in this class, I don't care. If you <laughs> want to say plus one, that's fine by me. But when we give that away, it actually goes to another atom. And so let's say we started here, again, with three and three, just like we did up here. But the electron that was there is now down there. What is the charge on this atom? Negative one, one or one negative. So now we have an atom that's positively charged and an atom that's negatively charged. What do you know about positives and negatives? They bond, right? They bond. Why do they bond? They're opposites of each other. What do opposites do? Attract. Opposites attract. And so it's just the attraction between a positive and a negative that makes an ionic bond. That is an ionic bond. Kind of like a magnet with a north, a 
attracted to a south, positive is attracted to a negative. They don't want to leave each other, and so when that electron got transferred, these two atoms got stuck together. Because now there's a force holding the positive and the negative together. That is an ionic bond. Yeah. Now what, what happens if it would have been two negative? So if we transfer two of them, we're now two plus and two minus. And this, this bond is actually stronger. Okay, but I, I was thinking just if one was, you know, one, so if it was minus three without changing, they just min or three minus, yeah, so would that, that would be a, that. a stronger negative, would it still bond? It, it would, if you take chemistry, what you learn is the positive and the negative have to balance out. And so what would happen is you'd have to, you'd end up with three of these, for a total of positive six, and two of these for a total of negative six. But that's beyond us. Okay. That's beyond <laughs> us. You need to know that positive and negative is attracted. Okay. Just curious. Yeah. In the molecular compound, where there is no metal, so everything is from the right side of the periodic table, we get these covalent bonds. And covalent bonds are the sharing of an electron. So imagine this pointer is an electron. In an ionic bond, I would give this pointer to Lane. It would be his at that point, but I just wouldn't want to leave it because I'm attached to that pointer and I don't want to lose it. And so I wouldn't leave Lane's side. In a covalent bond, though, I'm going to come over to Lane and we're going to both hold it. If we both hold it, we both get to claim it. We're both going to say it's ours. Thank you. And so in that case, I don't want to let go, because if I let go, Lane's going to take it. Lane doesn't want to let go, because if he lets go, I'm going to take it. And so neither one of us lets go, and we're stuck there. That is a covalent bond. The electron is shared. And there's no metal in there? And there's no metal. Yes. Ionic bond, transfer of an electron. It is given away. Covalent bond, molecular compound, the electron is shared. There are no charges involved in a covalent bond. Hmm. It's just we are both holding on to the same thing, and so we're stuck together. Moving on from the basics of what an atom and molecule is, we can take those and react them with each other. And we have a few different types of reactions. We're going to use these spherical atoms down here in our examples. This is just showing basically the ingredients that we have to start with for our reaction. We have two different atoms an A and a B, and then we have two different molecules, C, D, and E, F. So we're going to take different combinations of those, react them with each other, and see what happens. So we have three types here. There's an anabolic reaction. In biology, we call it an anabolic reaction. In chemistry, we call it a synthesis reaction. Same thing, two different terms. An anabolic reaction is going to store energy. And it's going to do that by taking multiple things and combining them into one big thing. So if you're taking small things and sticking them together to make something bigger, that is synthesis. Since synthesis means make it, right? So you're making something bigger. That is an anabolic reaction. The reverse of that is a catabolic reaction. In chemistry, we call it a decomposition reaction. It's falling apart. We're taking that big thing that we made and destroying it. We're breaking it back down into the smaller parts that went into it. The anabolic energy stored the energy by stringing them together. When we break it back apart, we release or make the energy. 
the way I remember anabolic and catabolic, because synthesis and decomposition make sense on their own to me, is that cats destroy things. <laughs> that's what they do. Right? True. Sure. Cats destroy things, that's breaking something apart. And then by default, anabolic is the other one. That is literally how I remember it. So we can build something up, we can destroy something, or we can just change things. That is the exchange reaction. And then there's the single displacement, double displacement. Some textbooks call it single <coughs> replacement and double replacement. It's the same thing. We'll see how those work. This is that catabolic reaction. Remember, catabolic is destruction. We're going to take something big, break it apart. Another term for catabolic is hydrolysis. And it's called hydrolysis because we're going to take water, hydro, and use it to break things apart, lysis. Lysis is breaking apart. This is catabolic? This is catabolic, yeah. So this is an example of catabolic. We have a large molecule. There's a bunch of things stuck together. We're going to break it apart into smaller, mo smaller molecules or just atoms and get energy out of it. In a chemical reaction, the arrow means exactly what you think it probably does. It means that turns into that. Okay? So the big thing turns into small things and energy. <coughs> and it's done with water. Right. So it's not shown, it's going to be shown There's here, we'll talk about it okay. here. But we're, what we're doing is we're essentially taking water and using the water to cut all of these individual bonds and the water gets stuck where that bond was. So this is a biological example of catabolism. This is much more complicated than you need to know. Okay? Basically what you're looking at here is each of these little hexagons is a sugar. And so this is a string of sugars. It's called glycogen. Glycogen is the storage molecule for sugar in our body. Most of it's in our liver. So in our livers right now, we have this big long string of sugars called glycogen. If we don't eat something for a while, and we need to get that sugar back out of our liver, we're going to use water to break that apart into glucose. Then there's other stuff we'll learn that happens to the glucose to turn it into something we can use. But all you need to see from this is that we took a string of glucose, and that string of glucose was called glycogen, and we broke it apart using water to make glucose. And when we got that glucose, we also got some energy out of it. Does that make sense? Pretty cool. So the reverse is the anabolic reaction, or anabolism. So this is when we took the glucose to make the glycogen. So let's say you eat something, with a bunch of sugar in it, but you're just sitting around doing whatever. You're not actually, actually exercising at the moment. So your body doesn't have a use for all of that glucose right then. And so it's going to store most of it as glycogen. So it's going to take it to the liver, it's going to take all the little glucose molecules, take some energy, put them together, and make glycogen. So this is glucose, again, much more complicated than you, you need to understand. But this is a glucose molecule. You take a glucose and a glycogen that's already partially made, and you're just going to stick that on the end. And so we started with an orange one and two yellows that were already stuck together. And all we did is we stuck the orange onto the string. And that string probably goes on for thousands and thousands, if not millions. And we're just sticking one extra glucose at a time onto the end. And that is anabolism. We're storing the energy in our liver. These are the exchange reactions. We don't have nearly as many good examples of this in our body. This is more of a straight chemistry idea. 
So in an exchange reaction, we can take molecules and we just change them. We're not building something bigger. We're not destroying something. We're just changing them. So in a single displacement reaction, we have a single atom and a molecule. And then that atom, the A here, is just going to kick C out and trade places with it. <laughs> so we started with an atom and a molecule, and we ended with an atom and a molecule. We didn't stick them together. We didn't destroy anything. We just changed them. And it's called single displacement because one atom changed places. That's in contrast to a double displacement where we started with two molecules, and they're just going to switch partners. So here, C is with D, E is with F. After the reaction, C is with F, and E is with D. All you need to know for exchange reactions is that it, they come in single and double, and that they change things. They don't destroy, they don't build, they just change. <coughs> The most common chemical in our body is water. We are mostly water. They throw a, the, the number around a lot, about two-thirds. We're about two-thirds water. There's a good reason for that. Okay? Water plays a whole bunch of functions in our body. And water may seem really, really simple, but it's actually one of the weirder molecules that we have. Okay? So water plays a whole bunch of roles in our body. Number one, it's going to help regulate body temperature. What is a way that water can help regulate body temperature? Water. Sweat. When it evaporates, it takes a whole bunch of heat with it. When it leaves and takes that heat, you cool off. Another way that water helps control our body temperature is that water actually requires a whole bunch of energy to change temperature. Something like ethanol or alcohol changes temperature very, very easily. Or think about metal. Metal changes temperature very, very easily. Think of your car, right? When it's cold out, your car gets very cold. But think about a lake. It can get really cold and the lake only changes temperature a little bit. Water changes temperature slowly. That's a good thing for us. Because if we go outside and it's hot, we heat up slowly. If we go outside and it's cold, we're going to get cold slowly. Water is also a good lubricant. It's going to lubricate our joints. We're going to learn that there is fluid in most of our joints. It's going to act as a lubricant to help them move. It's also going to lubricate things in our body that things need to pass over. The saliva in our mouth helps us to, to swallow, right? Tears in our eyes, it helps the eyelid to move. If you have dry eyes, that can be very, very uncomfortable, right? <coughs> Water is going to help with that. And it helps to protect our organs and tissues. Remember that serous fluid in those serous membranes? That's mostly water. And so it's basically a little water bag or air bag around the most important organs in our body. It's going to help protect it. If we don't have enough water, we get constipated. Nobody wants to be constipated. We use water to get toxins out of our body. That is one of the main purposes of urine. We take things that are in our body that we don't want to have in our body and we flush them out. If we're dehydrated, our kidneys stop functioning, we stop urinating. And so the toxins build up. So we need the water in our body to help flush them out. Most of the nutrients in our body, whether they're sugar or, or amino acids or minerals or oxygen, carbon dioxide, they all dissolve in water. Where is that water in our blood that's going to help move it around our body? Blood, right? All those things can dissolve in the blood, which is mostly water, and then we pump it through our body. If those things weren't soluble or did not dissolve in water, it wouldn't work very well. It'd 
be hard to get things from one part of our body to another. So if I eat something, my stomach absorb, my stomach digests it, my intestine absorbs it, it's then stuck there. How do I get stuff up to my brain where my brain needs to function? It dissolves in the water in the bloodstream and then comes on. Let's take a break. We'll come back at seven o'clock on that clock. That wasn't physics.
In context. Who have I not handed one back? covered how we can react them together to make different atoms and molecules. Those different atoms and molecules can be classified based on what they're made out of. We can give them different names. So an inorganic compound does not contain carbon. So if you look at a chemical and you see carbon, so either there's a name and there's carbon right in the name like carbon dioxide, that is called an organic compound. If there is no carbon, it is inorganic. The carbon on the periodic table is a C. For you, it's C. And so if you look at a chemical formula, which we didn't talk too much about, but if you see a formula and there's a C in it, that is going to be an organic compound, like CO2, which is the carbon dioxide. That has carbon in it. Most of our body, most of the molecules in our body that are actually going to do something are going to be organic. Most of the life molecules are organic molecules. We'll see, we'll see them. Acids are compounds that when you put them in water, they're going to make a hydrogen ion. So hydrogen is one of the elements, it's element number one. And an ion, we didn't talk about that, but an ion is an atom that has a charge. So when we had our positive charge and our negative charge there, we had made ions. So a hydrogen with a charge is a hydrogen ion. And it happens to be an H plus. So with an acid, when you put it into water, it makes hydrogen ions. That is the definition of an acid. What's the first acid that comes to mind when I ask for an example of an acid? It makes hydrogen ions. So hydrochloric acid is an example of an acid. Hydrochloric acid, this is not something you need to know, but it is HCl, a hydrogen and a chlorine. If you put that into water, they break apart, and you get H plus and Cl negative. There's our H plus. That is an acid. And there are lots and lots and lots of different acids. They all make H plus, or hydrogen ions. The opposite of an acid is a base. A base makes 
hydroxide ion or OH negative. So acids make H plus, bases make OH minus. If I take H plus and stick it with an OH minus, acids and bases react with each other. That's vinegar and baking soda, acid and base. What do I get if I put an H onto an OH minus? H two O. I now have two hydrogens and an oxygen. H two O. That was positive. That was negative. Together they cancel out H two O. Acids and bases react with each other to make water. We can also have those salts that we talked about. So a salt is going to have something, a metal, something from the left hand side of the periodic table. In it. But a salt is going to also not make hydrogen ion or hydroxide ion. So if you are an inorganic compound with no carbon and you are ionic, so you have something from the left, you are either an acid if you make hydrogen ion, a base if you make hydroxide, or a salt if you make ether. <coughs> so sodium chloride is a salt. So what is it cation and anion? I want to see if I, oh, if I had that on. So a cation and an anion are two different types of ions. One's positive, one is negative. Okay? A cation is a positive ion. Anions are negative ions. The way to remember this is that cations are positive. Yes, <laughs> cations are positive. Their anions are whatever's left, the negative ones. So salt can be anything but hydrogen and whatever Yes, so another example of a salt would be lithium bromide or calcium iodide. So it just can't have those two specific things? Yes. Because if, you, if, you, if you're going to make hydrogen, you're an acid. If you're going to make hydroxide, you're a base. If you're neither of them, you're a salt. So this is our hydrochloric acid. This is our acid. You put it in the water, and they break apart. When you put an ionic compound in the water, it breaks apart. So hydrochloric acid breaks apart into hydrogen and chlorine. This is an example of a base, this is potassium hydroxide, but we get a potassium and a hydroxide. So the key part here is, this is an acid, it made that. This is a base, it made that. This is a salt, this is potassium chloride, we get a potassium and a chlorine. It is not a hydrogen, it is not a hydroxide. So it's just a plain salt. But we'll never have both. Hydroxide and hydrogen. Correct. Now, the base is uh, pH is alkaline and then the, the acid is acidic. Yes. I, I, I read your mind. Look at that. <laughs> yes. That's crazy. So, acids and bases deal with pH. pH tells you how acidic something is. If you're an acid, you're very acidic. If you're a base, you're very not acidic. Okay. So the pH scale, you are not going to have to calculate pHs. But if you're interested, the way you calculate a pH is you take the negative log of the concentration of the acid. So this is the symbol for acid. This is log the logarithm, and the brackets mean concentration. You're not going <laughs> to have to do it. But what this tells you is that the higher the concentration that you put in here. The more acid you have, because it's negative log, the pH is going to go down. Which tells us that a low pH is very acidic. So here we have our pH scale. Neutral, not acidic, <coughs> not basic, just pure water is a pH 
of 7. 7 is neutral. That's an important number. 7 is neutral. Anything below 7 is acidic. Most people think the pH scale goes down to 1. This shows it going to 0. In actuality, it has no end. It's very, very easy to get a pH negative 1, negative 2. There's probably some in that room right there. If you go above 7, you become basic. You're going the opposite direction. This shows it going up to 14. Most people say the pH scale goes up to 14. It doesn't actually stop again. It goes to infinity. <coughs> it's very easy to make a pH 15, 16, 17. So over here, we have some examples of what would be at that pH. The pure water is 7. That is the definition of neutral. Urine can be in a range, but it shows it between 4.8 to 7.5. And so urine is usually a little acidic, but it's actually possible for it to be a little basic. Rainwater is acidic. That's actually because there's carbon dioxide dissolved in it. It doesn't mean poop pollution. It can make it worse. But just normal rainwater, when the dinosaurs were roaming around, rainwater was still acidic. It was still acid rain. I'm surprised the milk isn't. Yeah, it, 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 it's, I thought this, when I first learned this in high school, I thought I would have thought that would have been alcohol. Yeah. But it's actually a little bit acidic. Vinegar, which is Pork. acetic acid, is acidic all the way down here and about pH 1 is our stomach acid. stomach acid. That is why we dissolve or digest things in our stomach. It's very acidic. It helps break down things, especially heartburn, especially protein. And if you have heartburn, it comes up, you actually start digesting your esophagus, basically. So down here at pH 0 is one molar hydrochloric acid, which is actually, in terms of science, a very weak solution of hydrochloric acid. When you buy it, it's 12 times more concentrated than that. Coming up a little bit, detergent that you use to wash your clothes, about a pH of 10. <coughs> Antacids, things you use to counteract the heartburn, are about 10.5, 10 to 11. Ammonia that you might use for washing your clothes also is about 12. What people used to use to clean things and to make soap is called lye. We don't use that all that often anymore. But that's getting really basic. And then actual sodium hydroxide, a, a chemistry type base, is up here at 40. What about sodium bi bicarbonate? Sodium bicarbonate is a weak base. And so it's probably going to be in here. Baking soda's there? Yeah. Baking okay. soda is probably detergent. Milk and magnesia area. What about like calcium? Because when they give you calcium tablets tonight, they give you half a time. So calcium, when you put it into water, it makes hydroxide actually. It's, and so it's gonna be basic. It depends on whether it is pure calcium or calcium with something like chloride. If you have something like calcium chloride, it's going to have no effect on this whatsoever. If you have a chunk of calcium and you put it in there, it's going to be basic. It's, it's actually going to react with the water and make hydroxide. But that's beyond us. So our blood pH is very, very important to our health. <coughs> very, very important. So we are going to regulate that pH very closely. We do not want to change much. We want roughly an equal number of the hydroxi hydroxides and the hydrogens. We want to be near neutral. But act, act, in actuality, we are not perfectly neutral. We are pH 7.35 to 7.45. We are a little bit basic. <coughs> Anywhere between 7.35 and 7.45 is considered okay. If we get outside of that, we start to feel sick. If we are, are too acid, we say we're suffering from acidosis. 
If we are too basic, we say we're suffering for alkalosis. Alkaline and basic are the same thing. If you go too high or too low, you die. Die? What's that cause of death? You would become, your pH would become so weird, all the enzymes in your body that we're going to learn about would just stop working. And so nothing in your body would work. Is that fairly rare, though? Yeah. Yeah. And so we need to maintain this normal pH. And if something goes haywire and we get over here, we need to be able to stop it from going <coughs> here. And we need to be able to turn it around and get it back over here. We use something called a buffer system. A buffer system serves the purpose of preventing large pH changes. That's what it does. It prevents large changes in pH. And it does that by taking a strong acid or a strong base, something that would change our pH a lot, and converting it into a weak acid or base, which is going to have a smaller effect. And so before it can change our pH too much, we're going to convert it into something that's not as strong. Okay, so now we're going to move on and start learning about the biological molecules. We're going to have a number of different categories that we're going to put them into. And then in each category, there's going to be some subcategories. The first one we're going to talk about is an organic compound called carbohydrates, a term you've heard a lot, right? These are organic compounds, which means that they have carbon in them. That's why they're called carbohydrates. Carbon is for, for carbon. What do you think hydrates mean? Water. Water. What atoms, what elements are in water? H2O, hydrogen, oxygen. Carbohydrates are made of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. The name tells water. you what they're made of. The subtypes of carbohydrates are sugars. That's what you think of when you talk of, think about limiting your carbohydrate intake. Starches, potatoes, things like that, are starches. There are a whole bunch of the sugars strung together from in the anabolic reaction. The glycogen in our liver and cellulose is also a carbohydrate. We don't really worry about our cellulose intake in terms of carbs, though, because we can't digest cellulose. And so it just passes through its, its fiber. These carbohydrates can be broken down into three types based on how big they are. A monosaccharide, mono meaning one, has one sugar. Greek, I think it's Greek, maybe it's Latin. For, for sugar or sweet is saccharide. And so saccharide is a sugar. Monosaccharide is a simple sugar, it's just one. Remember when we had those <laughs> hexagons? Mm -hmm. Each one of those hexagons was a monosaccharide. And the best example of a monosaccharide is glucose. That is the most basic fuel for our body. If we take two monosaccharides and stick them together, we get a disaccharide. Di meaning two. Best example of a disaccharide is sucrose. That's just normal table sugar. That is a glucose and a fructose stuck together. That's all sucrose is. If we take a whole bunch of these and stick them together, we get what's called a polysaccharide. Poly just meaning many. So you don't normally see things that are three and four. You normally see one, two, and a whole bunch. It kind of skips. So these are very large. They're a whole bunch, even maybe hundreds, if not thousands, or maybe even millions of these monosaccharides struck strong together. It says the dehydration synthesis. Remember we said catabolism was hydrolysis. We're going to use water to break it apart. We're, in that case, we're putting water into it to break it. And so when we made it, we pulled water out of it. And so we dehydrated it. So when you make something big, water comes out. 
when you want to break it apart, you put the water back in. So here, glucose and fructose. We're going to use dehydration synthesis. Put them together to make our sucrose. We can go backwards using hydrolysis and break them back apart. Again, this is much more complicated in terms of the drawing than you need to be able to understand. <laughs> there's a glucose ring, there's a fructose ring, stick them together, and you have a sucrose. So hydrolysis, you put the water in? Yes, hydrolysis, you put the water in to break it back apart. Okay. When you put them together, the water comes out. There's just a couple other examples of disac disaccharides that you might have heard of. Lactose and then maltose. Lactose, it's in, it's in dairy, right? I'll just say it. I say milk. That sounds weird, right? Milk. 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 M-I-L-K. Milk. It's milk. Milk. <laughs> so the way I fi the way I figure, I am from Michigan. That is next to Wisconsin, who has all the cows. So surely Wisconsin knows how to pronounce milk. And so I must be pronouncing it correct. That's a, that's a powerful argument. Mm -hmm. It's milk. That, that's why I got me a PhD. <laughs> So this is glycogen. This is where we took all of that glucose and we're going to store it in our liver. It turns into a big, complicated thing. It's not just one long string. It actually branches. And so it turns into this big meshwork, actually. And so we can be adding here, 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 all at once. Why that's important is because then we can also break it apart, all those points at once. This allows us to get energy out quickly. If we had one long string, we can only take one from each end, and then one from each end, and then one from each end. And we're very limited how fast we can get that energy back out of our liver. But if we can take 10 at a time, we're getting our energy out much quicker. It's like if you have a bunch of money in the bank, and they say you can only withdraw $100 a day. But you need money now. You're stuck. Next type of organic compound is a lipid. Lipids are oils and fats. Lipids are hydrophobic, meaning they do not dissolve in water. That's what we say by, mean by insoluble. Carbohydrates do dissolve in water. They are soluble in water. Lipids are insoluble. Again, they are carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The difference is how they're put together. How they are arranged determines whether you're a carbohydrate or a lipid. And chemically, those are very different things. Lipids include triglycerides, which are the fats and oils. The fats in our body are triglycerides. Something like soybean oil. That is a triglyceride. In general, animals have fats plants have oils. So for us, mostly we're talking about fats other than maybe the oils that we eat in terms of nutrition. It also includes phospholipids. We'll see phospholipids again. Phospholipids make up the cell membrane. The outer border of every cell in our body is made up of phospholipids. They are lipids that also have phosphorus. Steroids are considered lipids because they do not dissolve in water. In terms of the chemical and how they're arranged, the steroids look very, very, very different than these. We'll see some of them. There are actually a whole bunch of rings stuck together. They're pretty cool looking. Steroids are not just what you imagine Barry Bonds and all those people <laughs> take. Okay? We have steroids in our body normally. They play a very, very important role. Almost all of the hormones in our body are steroids. And so steroid is a big thing that people 
either they isolate them, they, they take something like testosterone, which a man or male normally has, and they take extra of it, or they make synthetic <laughs> steroids that the person normally doesn't have at all, and they take that. But we do have a whole bunch of steroids in our body all the time. But ours aren't anabolic, are they? <clears throat> I'm honestly not that familiar with the difference between anabolic steroids. What people take in what, yeah. what we have. Fat soluble vitamins are also <coughs> considered lipids. Vitamin A, D, E, and K are considered fat soluble. And so if you take a vitamin, a multivitamin, if you look on the on the bottle, it's going to list water soluble vitamins and fat soluble or lipid soluble. Because these are fat soluble, that means they do not dissolve in water. So in order for us to absorb them, they have to be dissolved in fat or oil. Which means if you just take a vitamin with no food whatsoever, or let's say you just drink it with water or coke or something like that, where there's no fat, that what fat soluble vitamin is going to go right through. In order to absorb that, you need to take it with something that has fat or oil in it. So if it is fat, you have to eat with it, basically. Correct. Gotcha. Correct. I always take my And so generally, eating at the same time is not going to have much of an effect on the water side. Well, it's not, it's not like you're going to hurt fat. Right. <coughs> this is a triglyceride. Tri, because there are three chains coming off. Glyceride, because there is a glycerol that is the backbone. So I realize you you have not taken organic chemistry. You're not comfortable looking at a structure like this. But what you're looking at, each of these letters is an atom. There's carbon, there's hydrogen, there's oxygen. The lines are bonds. And so if there's a line between two things, they're stuck together. So what you see is there's a backbone here, and then there's three long chains coming off. That's a triglyceride. The fat in our body, the soybean oil that we eat, the peanut oil, whatever you're using, looks like that. And so the difference between them is what types of chains are stuck on. There's a bunch of different ones you can stick together and make different combinations. A phospholipid looks very similar. There's a backbone, but there's instead of three chains, there's two chains and a phosphate. Just think of it as phosphorus. Okay. The difference between phosphorus and phosphate is higher than you need to be at this point. So there's an extra, instead of the third chain was replaced with a phosphorus or a phosphate. And what this does is it makes it so that this molecule has a part that's hydrophobic, does not like water, and a part that's hydrophilic, which does like water. And so that's going to cause it to orient a certain way to make a cell membrane. And so we'll see this when we talk about the skin later on, but you end up with a molecule that looks like this. And they're going to orient like this, and so that's going to be the membrane that separates the outside of the cell from the inside of the cell. The inside of the cell is mostly water. So the head points towards the water. Outside that cell, what's that interstitial fluid? Water. So the head is going to stick out. But then you get these tails in here, which help prevent the water from the inside from getting out, and the water from the outside from getting in. These are the steroids. So you got all these different rings that fit together real nice like a puzzle. So you don't need to get too much out of this. Cholesterol is considered the prototypical steroid. Most of the steroids in our body get made out of cholesterol. This is estradiol, which is estrogen, same thing. That looks very similar to that, doesn't it? That got made from cholesterol. Some of the bonds are different, some of these things are different, but the same basic four ring structure is the same. Next are proteins. 
For protein, when you think of protein, what do you think of? Uh, muscle. muscle, yes. When you think of protein, you probably think of muscle. The bulk of protein in our body is muscle. When you think about eating protein, what do you think of? Meat. meat. And what is meat? Protein. Muscle. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> it is protein. And so when we take in protein, most of that is in the form of muscle. There's a whole bunch of protein in muscle. And that's because proteins are the molecules in our body that do things. Anything in our body that actually does something is going to be a protein. In moving my arm or lifting this table is a whole lot of doing something. And so I need a whole bunch of protein to make that happen. Which is why most of our protein in our body is muscle, the protein that we eat is muscle. Yes? Does that have anything to do with white and dark meat? Something that I was reading something about that the other day about how much it moves, the muscle moves or something. So dark meat has more oil in it because that's a muscle that moves a lot more. Mm -hmm. So it needs a lot of energy. And so there's energy stored there in the form of oil. Okay. Breast meat, the chickens don't will really fly, right? right? And so they don't need that muscle anymore. Exactly. And so it's white meat. Okay. So is it better for you to have dark meat instead of oil? Oh, damn it. In terms of nutrition, general nutrition, yes, dark meat would probably be better. But the problem most of us have is not malnutrition, it's too much fat. Too much oil? Yeah. Oh, and so for great. most of us, white meat's probably better. Okay. Huh. But if you are, are actually malnourished, you don't have any nutrients, Dark meat probably better. Okay. But, like I said, proteins are the molecules that do everything. And we're going to learn that there's a whole lot of everything that goes on in our body. It's not just muscles. All of the proteins that run a cell, that make every cell work, there's a whole bunch of them in there. Those are all proteins. They're not, that have nothing to do with muscle whatsoever. Proteins are very large. And they have a whole bunch of different elements in them. There's the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But then we're also going to throw in nitrogen and sulfur. These are very complex structures. There are people who spend their entire career studying the structures of proteins. A, 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 a dissertation that gets you a PhD usually is the study of the structure of a single protein. Okay. They're very, very complex. They have a lot of different roles. They're the ones that do everything, like I said. If something needs to get moved. If something needs to get broken down. If something needs to get made. It's a protein that's going to do it. It's also the protein that makes the structure of our cells. When we talk about the cells, we're going to learn that there's something called a cytoskeleton. Cyto means cell. So the cell skeleton is inside it's a whole bunch of chains, basically support beams inside of the cell that holds the membrane out, prevents it from collapsing. Those big long support beams are made out of protein. The proteins are made up of small building blocks. The building blocks are called amino acids. So every protein in your body is a different string of amino acids. How many there are, what order they're put in, is what determines the difference between protein A <coughs> and protein B. Every amino acid has an amino group. That's why it's amino acid. It's amino group. Think of it as a nitrogen. Nitrogen is the important part there. Amino acid has a nitrogen, the amino part, and then it has a carboxyl group. This is also carboxylic acid. So it's amino acid. Because there's an amino part and there's an acid part. And there are only 20 different amino acids. So all of the thousands and thousands of different proteins we have in our body are different combinations of 20 amino acids. And so there's three parts, actually three parts to an amino acid. Is the amino, the acid, 
and then a side chain called an R group. And so the difference between the two different amino acids is what's on that side chain. So imagine you have something that's made with three parts. Here we have an NH2, here we have a COOH, and then there's the R. They're all the same down here. The only difference is what, what the R is. No, there are 20 different side chains, and so you would have 20 of these, each with a different R group. It's like having... <laughs> totally different amino acids, though. Yes. So there's just 20 total. Yes. It's like having a, a bucket of Legos. You have 20 Legos, and the only difference, 20 different Legos, and the only difference between each different Lego is the R group. To make a protein, we take the amino acids and we string them together end to end. This literally is a single strand end to end. It does not branch like, like that glycogen does. We take the amino acids and we string them together with something called a peptide bond. That's an important term. I'm sure you're going to see that in important days. So a peptide mm -hmm. bond is the bond that holds the amino acids together in a protein. It's called a peptide bond because once you put just a few amino acids together, that's called a peptide. Once you get a whole bunch of them, then it's a protein. So it's like the atoms and molecules? Yes. So atoms come together to make a molecule. Amino acids come together to make a bigger molecule, which is a protein. Where, where's the peptide coming in? So if I have, if I have one, it's an amino acid. That's an atom, right? Okay. That's an atom. Amino acid is a small molecule. Okay. And so if I have one, and we're we're looking at the biological level, so we're not rather than atoms and molecules, we're looking at combinations of molecules putting them together. Okay. So this is one molecule. Okay. If I have one. It's an amino acid. If I have two, or three, or four, or five, some sort of reasonable number, it's a peptide. Okay. Once I have hundreds or thousands, it's a protein. Okay. So an amino acid peptide. Protein. Okay. Yes. Do you know about how much, what, like a gram of protein? How many of those you would need? Is it in the millions? Just for one gram of. How many amino acids? Yeah. Strings. I can I can I can calculate it. I'll get you at the break. Okay. I can tell you an exact number. Really? Cool. So this is our amino acid. We have this the carboxy group, the acid group, the amino group, and then the R. So here are two different amino acids. This one is called glycine. This one is called alanine. These are the two simplest ones. On the glycine, the R group is just a hydrogen. Right. That is literally as simple as it can be because that is the simplest atom that you can stick there. An alanine has a carbon and some hydrogens. So the rest of the molecule is exactly the same. The only difference is what is here. So that's an amino acid, that's an amino acid. We stick them together with a peptide bond and we now have a peptide. This is dipeptide. Don't worry about the whole di, tri, anything. It's a peptide. If it's small, if it's a peptide, it's a peptide. If you get really big, it's then a protein. Okay. Enzymes are the proteins in our body that function. They make things. They break things, they move things. The enzymes are the proteins in our body that do things. Making that connection that an enzyme is a protein is an important connection. We hear the term enzyme occasionally when you read about medicine or on TV and things. Making the connection that that is a protein. That is just a big molecule. 
for me, is an important idea to get in your head. So this is an example of an enzyme. A lot of enzymes are main, named based off of what they do. <coughs> so this is an enzyme called sucrase. If you see an enzyme that ends with ACE, it's usually going to break apart something. And this is sucrase, and so it breaks apart sucrose. So here we have an enzyme. An enzyme has what's called an active site. That's not a term you need to know, but it's, it's the part of the enzyme that actually grabs onto something and does something to it. It's about where the activity happens. And so you can see it's got this little slot here that looks like it's made for sucrose. And it is literally made for sucrose. Nothing else will fit in there. It's like a lock and key. A sucrose, which is a disaccharide, comes in, it fits in there, the enzyme breaks it apart. Here they're bound together, now they're broken. Once they break, they float away. The enzyme's now sitting here, ready to go again. Enzymes do not break apart. They get used over and over and over again until eventually they get worn out and die. But it's not a one and done thing. They'll actually do this millions of times per second. Wow. They just cycle on and off and on and off and on and off. Next are nucleic acids. Where do you know nucleic acids from? Nowhere. So nucleic acids include DNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Okay. So like proteins, these are strings of building blocks. Nucleic acids are a string of <coughs> nucleotides. A protein is a string of amino acids. A nucleic acid is a string of nucleotides. DNA has four different nucleotides. Proteins have 20 different building blocks. DNA has four. What Add, proteins have 20. There are 20 amino acids. Okay. That's the basic building block, so there are 20 things you can put together. Okay. With DNA, you only have four options. Okay. The DNA, we're going to learn, is the instructions for us. <coughs> Our, imagine writing the instructions for a house using four letters. It would be very, very difficult. But we do it. That is us. They are adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine. Usually, when we use these, we abbreviate them with their first letter, A, G, C, and T. RNA is very, very similar to DNA. Instead of deoxyribonucleic acid, it's just ribonucleic acid. Again, we have four nucleotides. Three of them are the same. One of them is different. Instead of a T, we have a U. RNA, we'll learn, is a temporary copy of the DNA. What does that mean? So, we'll learn a lot about this on Tuesday in the cell lecture. Basically, the, pro the DNA is the instructions to make a protein. Okay? But they are the master copy. The DNA, the DNA is the master copy. And so you yeah, protect okay. that with your life. And so what you do is you make a copy of it in the RNA, and then you take the RNA to the job site and you use that. So it's the intermediary. It's what's between the DNA and the protein. Okay. Hmm. And so we'll learn, we go DNA to RNA to protein. DNA, RNA, protein. Over and over and over again. So do the four things on DNA, is that what creates, of course, the caduceus spiral? God damn it. Do you want to just... Yeah. <laughs> you at least make my slides for me. Gosh, that's too... So, DNA has A, G, C, and T. RNA has A, G, C, and U. That makes a very nice exam question. If I give you a sequence, just a whole bunch of letters strung together, 
and ask you, is this DNA or RNA? You're going to look, do you have T's or do you have U's? Yeah. If you have T's, it's DNA. If you have U's, it's RNA. How do you remember that other than knowing a fault? How do I know which one is, which one has T's, which one has U's? Yeah, yeah how do you remember that? Because normally we deal with DNA a whole lot more than we deal with RNA, okay. and I deal with T. It's just yeah. automatically, I say A, T, C, G. Because what we're going to learn here is that they have to pair, okay? And A only pairs with T. Only. Okay. And C only pairs with G. And so I have drilled in my head for decades A, T, C, G. I probably say it in my sleep. I don't know. <laughs> but I know ATCG, that is the most basic thing. That's DNA. Okay. And then I have to stop and think, well, if I'm dealing with RNA, now I have to put the U's in. And in actuality, in medical research, most people just do T's anyways. When you write it out, who's going to put a T for RNA? It doesn't really matter. <laughs> the last type of nucleic acid is adenosine triphosphate, which is a molecule that we're going to come back to over and over and over and over again. This is called ATP. ATP is the energy currency of our body. It is the energy currency of a cell. This is what cells and proteins use as their energy source. We take in glucose, and lipids and proteins digest them for the purpose of turning them into ATP. We get ATP out of that, and ATP is what makes things run. We take the ATP, we break it. When we break it, we get energy out. And we'll see this over and over and over again through the semester. This is the DNA, double helix, that Lane was referring to. And this is the ATCG pairing that I was referring to. And so it's called the double helix because we actually have two nucleic acid strands. This strand is completely separate from that strand. They can and do float away from each other. But normally, they are stuck together because they pair like that. And so it's like a zipper in each base, each nucleotide along the way matches up perfectly with the one across from it and holds it together. Mm -hmm. And so here we see A and T stick together because they make they each make two bonds. So they stick to each other. C and G stick together because they each make three. If you try to stick that with that, bonds don't line up and they don't stick. So it just doesn't work. This is our ATP. There's three parts. The important part of ATP is this. These phosphates, the phosphorus coming off the end. ATP has a lot of energy in it. We get energy out by cutting that third phosphorus off. When we cut that third phosphorus off, that floats away, that floats away, and we get energy. This is ATP. And that is the end of the slideshow. Wow. Two minutes short. Okay. So we'll take a break. We'll come back to the lab.